but uh, all right, so we're gonna go ahead and get started here. So this is our sixth <laughs> meeting of the year. Yay, it's awesome, we like that. So first up is Jordan with his petroleum geochemistry techniques and concepts and exploration. Oh my God, it looks like a mountain man. I <laughs> love it. Okay, so um, I put this together a couple years ago um, for, uh, I guess it was a geo talk it was the first time I gave it, but um, given a few other times. So originally, um, we don't have a petroleum geochemistry class here. And I was inspired by a young woman named uh, April, uh, who is now a geophysicist at Syracuse. Um, and every, uh, every holiday break, she would get a textbook, read it cover to cover and just be amazing. And so I decided to try the same thing, um, taught myself geochemistry as best I could. And um, so this is all theory. Uh, other than a little bit of gas chromatography that I did, I don't have any hands-on experience. And as you guys know, the map is not the territory. So um, if, um, if anything's wrong, if I'm incorrect about anything, mistaken, please let me know. Um, <laughs> so uh, we did the Imperial Barrel Award a couple of years ago um, with these this group of fantastic people. Um, Dr. Uh, Peruz was our sponsor that year. It was the first time we ever did it and he just knocked it out of the park. Uh, Robert Webster was our in uh, industry liaison, fantastic guy. Um, so a lot of work, uh, a lot of uh, flared tempers and late nights and all of that, but it was worth it because we won. So here's our uh, after party. Um, our oh, that's right. yeah, I remember that. there, pretty warm. Memory. Um, so a couple of resources that we do have. Uh, Lowell Waite and the Permian Basin Research Lab teaches a course. Um, it's, a, it's a graduate level course, but I believe you can get undergraduate credit for it. Uh, so I would definitely look into that. It's an amazing class. Even if you're not really interested in oil and gas, just the geology you're gonna learn is, is fantastic. Um, same goes with the Permian Basin uh, class as well. So uh, there was also a petrophysics short course put together. Um, a guy named William Price uh, taught it. He's from Petrophysical Solutions out of Houston, I believe. Um, and I believe I got this right, but I think Polly actually organized the whole thing. Um, so you guys, she's very busy uh, writing her dissertation, but you guys might want to um, talk to her and, and see if you can get some contact info and maybe do this again. Um, it was drinking from a fire hose, a lot of information, but at the end of the day, got a lot of uh, take home material and I felt pretty competent actually. So it was, um, it was a pretty good experience. Uh, so let's get into some background, uh, just some basics of organic chemistry. Generally, when you see a hydrocarbon, you're gonna see CNHX. Uh, um, and real quick, anybody know what it's called when you add an oxygen to it? No longer hydrocarbon. If you're on a diet, you probably know. It's a carbohydrate. So, um, so carbon has four valence electrons, and a basic shape is a tetrahedron. A silica files know all about that. Um, so, some name, uh, some nomenclature is you have single bonds that end with ane, like propane. Double bonds, ene, ethylene. Triple bonds, yne, so butyne. Um, they're often, you often find cyclical arrangements, and that's really going to play a part in our story later. Um, there are primary structures, and that's really the skeletal structure of the carbon. And then secondary structures, when you start kinking things with double bonds and stuff like that, tertiary bonds are like London forces and hydrogen bonds that kind of manipulate the molecule. And then quaternary are um, kind of uh, uh, extra chemical situations where a good example is Tamiflu, the antiviral used for influenza. So um, basically at room temperature, it's kind of flat, doesn't do much. But when you put it in blood, which has a, it's slightly basic, it's like a 7.4 um, uh, pH, it takes on a quaternary shape that happens to fit perfectly with the receptor of the uh, influenza and basically allows it not to do its thing. Uh, so. Also, there are ISO and N configurations. So ISO means um, equal, so like isometric, equal in all dimensions. Um, so when you see basically T structures like that, 
those are the iso molecules and then n is normal more like chains or uh kink bands um like zigzags um so this is just a, a summation of a few of the classes. There are many, many classes, but this is just um, some that are uh, germane to our conversation here. So saturated hydrocarbons means that for every um, possible bond in the, uh, in the R group, you have a hydrogen linking to it. Um, R group is what we call, refer to the um, skeletal structure <clears throat> of the carbons, the carbon chain or the, the carbon skeleton. And functional groups are the things that attach to them. Those are generally what, what do the uh, chemical interactions. So then you have uh, aromatic hydrocarbons, and these are represented by a carbon ring um, with functional groups attached. Uh, they could be um, cyclical or polycyclical. You've probably heard of polycyclical uh, aromatic, hy aromatic hydrocarbons um, when talking about cancer. They're, uh, they're very, very carcinogenic. Uh, uh, organic solvents and, and just the things you wear masks for when you're painting and doing uh, fiberglass and that kind of stuff. NSOs are nitrogen sulfur oxygen compounds. Um, they generally have a very strong double bond system. Um, it usually attaches to another R group and then oftentimes you'll, uh, it'll attach to a cation like iron or something like that. All sulfides are also counted in this group. Um, these are generally where the organometallics come in. So when you're looking at petroleum, it's not just carbon. There are, um, there are cations that are in there, um, oftentimes vanadium. In fact, some, uh, some petroleums can be upwards of five weight percent vanadium. Pretty impressive. Uh, asphaltines are these giant, very complicated, uh, very heavy structures. They form solids. They don't migrate very easily. Now, they're not cold, um, but they're a lot heavier than you know, the liquid phases. Um, and then naphtha uh, comes from the Persian word for wet, um, and that refers to hydrocarbons that are in the liquid state at standard temperature and pressure, so on the Earth's surface. The uh, origin for information, um, it's a delicate balance to actually create petroleum. So you have two different sources of terrestrial and marine. You can identify those chemically. We'll see that later. Um, the settings, it has to be right in, within a, uh, a redox window. So it can't be too anoxic um, and it can't be too uh, oxidizing or it's things just break down and decay. Uh, and then sedimentation, um, you have to have, there's a sweet spot in sedimentation rate. It seems to be right below one millimeter per year. Um, if you have it, if it's too much, too fast, it gets buried and breaks down. Um, if it's not buried fast enough, Basically, it just rots away. And then grain size can play a big role. Um, if it's too small, if you have little clays, there's essentially uh, things get trapped and nothing can move around. Um, and then if it's too large, it just dissipates and, and migrates out. Um, and ultimately, these things are lighter than the rock, so they want to migrate upward. So we start with the remains of a dead animal or dead organism. And then that will break down something called kerogen. Um, sometimes it's referred to as humic gel. And basically um, that's, that's when all of the hard work that life did to make these organic chains that are very unstable, like there's nothing in biology that is, that is just a stable molecule. Um, so all of our metabolism that goes into creating all these things breaks down very quickly and forms more energy uh, stable chemicals. So these are generally called um, bitumen when it starts partitioning. And it, we like to think of uh, solubility as this <laughs> polar opposite of where you have a polar and a nonpolar. And in reality, it's a continuum um, where polarity is a big factor, but there are also other things that affect it. Um, so Basically, you start breaking these chemicals down. Uh, they start partitioning based on solubility, relative solubility as well. So some things will want to go into the water more than the oil. Uh, some things will want to basically stay in between. Um, and then the asphaltines, the heavier stuff, want to stay behind completely. So that's when you get this, it's called solvent extraction. Um, things start moving around. And then you get cracking when things get high enough. Um, the water, the vapor pressure of water under certain conditions is actually enough to break the carbon bonds. 
um, starts with the single bonds and then will work its way up to double bonds depending on the strength. And so the ratios of uh, oxygen and, uh, and hydrogen to carbon are very important. So as you're breaking these things down, more carbon bonds are taking place and the hydrogen is being released. Um, but instead of at, uh, a trend where you would normally expect it to go to the aromatic hydrocarbons, uh, it actually goes up to this field called the oil field. And that's because of all of the free uh, hydrogens are now being bonded to the unsaturated carbon. Um, the Van Krebelen diagram. So it's a ratio of ratios, same oxygen and hydrogen. Um, something to note is uh, we're almost logarithmic or almost one uh, order of magnitude away from each other. Um, and what this actually allows us to do is to view the oil window, which we usually think of in terms of pressure, temperature, depth, uh, into a chemical um, composition. And so essentially this is showing you you start with your kerogen, you go through the diagenesis, which is the burial processes. Um, and then this is that oil window. So this is where things are being formed. Um, and then basically you get down to your wet gas, your dry gas, these are overmaturation products. Um, so basic maturation here, you start with the kerogens um, and I'll get to this in a minute, but that's called the vitronite reflectance. Um, but for now, let's just focus on the right side of this, where um, essentially the kerogen, as it's going, um, it, you have a lot of uh, anabolic reactions at first. Things are breaking down to lower energy states. But then when you really start the uh, oil generation, it turns to a catabolic, um, more catabolic reactions. And so there's more energy in the system, uh, higher energy molecules that would be normally unstable are more stable in these higher uh, energy regimes. And so you go from these random orientations with a lot of hydrogen to um, more ordered structures, uh, more aromatic hydrocarbons, um, of lower ratios of hydrogen to carbon. And it's called prefer preferred orientations are these essentially higher energy states that are stable. And then over maturation, once you go past the oil window, um, you break things down, all the carbon starts cracking, and you're really just left with, uh, with gas. Um, and then you have this ordered residue, it's, it's graphite-like material, and it's basically just pressed carbon. So, um, so kerogen, there are four main types with the additional note that there's a type S, uh, type 2S, which means sulfur rich. Um, and I was reading about this last night, actually, just put this on there. Some uh, oils can be up to 14 weight percent sulfur, which is just amazing. You know, I don't even know how, but the median seems to be about 3%. Um, so you can see that they have different, um, different uh, ratios of oxygen and uh, hydrogen. They have different sources. Uh, the setting, the, the original deposition setting is very different. And then the maturation products, which is what we really care about. So just looking at this, anybody, Answer what kind of kerogen would an exploration geologist hope to find? Uh, what? Oh, well, so which, which kerogen type? Oh, sorry. I was looking at... <laughs> okay. So we can immediately discount number four no oil and gas produced. He wouldn't be a very good exploration geologist if he went that route. Uh, type three, you're just going to get uh, some butane and maybe some propane, and uh, and so really you're you're looking for type one and two. Um, generally, type one seems to be the richest, um, but type two can produce some pretty good uh, petroleum as well. Um, total organic carbon. This is a uh, you say TOC to anyone in this field, they know exactly what you're talking about. Um, it's measured in whole rock weight percent, it describes this, the richness. So you'll hear petroleum engineers and petroleum uh, geologists talk about richness of, of source rocks, as well as uh, richness of reservoir rocks. But um, So it doesn't account for the kerogen type or uh, migrated hydrocarbons. So if you are looking at a reservoir rock, you need to take that into account. Um, and then contamination from drilling mud is a very big deal. Um, a lot of drilling mud uses benzene and other uh, 
polycyclic hydrocarbons because they're excellent solvents um, and they do a good job of lubricating the drilling mud. And, um, but it messes with the geochemists in the field. So there are, I'm gonna go through five different ways of, uh, of analyzing petroleum sources. Um, so basically all of them, you get a rock from the ground and go to the lab and do your thing. So let's start with the, uh, the easiest, rock eval pyrolysis. Uh, so you take, you take your rock cuttings, um, you wash them, you put them in a chamber with usually argon or something inert, um, and then you heat it. And so the first stage you heat it to 300 degrees and you leave it there and that's gonna produce your S1 curve. Um, you take all of these curves and you process them uh, afterward and I'll explain that in a minute. But, uh, and so basically as you heat this, all of the volatiles are gonna come off. They're gonna be sucked into a chamber where there's a flame ionizer, it gets burned off. You count all of the CO2 at the end. Uh, and so I guess I should mention that these, these spikes, these are, uh, it's temperature and abundance. So the S2 peak is kind of the, the gold standard. Um, that's what's called the generating potential. This is how much oil you're actually going to be able to get out of a rock. Um, it's a theoretical limit. We know that you know, the, the more we pull out, the harder it is to keep getting. So, um, and then the temperature max is recorded as a peak and that's used for some other calculations. Uh, and then there's an S3 curve is when the actual uh, combustion takes place. Now there's no oxygen in here. So any combustion that happens is actually uh, the oxygen from the rock itself. Um, you have a thermal max. Um, so that can tell you what type of oil, uh, what type of carriage you're looking at. Yeah, uh, type one, type two, type three, all have different ones. And then basically at 470, that represents the bottom of the oil window where everything cracks and breaks down into methane. Um, you have a hydrogen index and an oxygen index. You can use those for different um, calculations as well. And then a production index, which basically um, is the hydrogen or sorry, hydrocarbon generated versus the hydrocarbon potential. Uh, that's, that's the number that people, if you're looking for investment, that's the number people are gonna wanna look at. Um, and then also I should mention that drilling muds um, can cause interference, particularly on that S1 curve. Uh, and there are just volumes of references you can go to uh, experimental values to essentially correct for this. Um, so kerogen can mix. You can have type one and type two that are just all migrating into one reservoir. Um, and you can see this just on these data trends. So, uh, you can see the diamonds are the oil prone and the triangles are the gas prone. So if you're looking to make some money, you're really going to go for the oil prone and you can kind of, um, you can see it in the trend is where you want to go. And also you can see it in the S2 curves. Um, so the S2 curve, instead of being a nice Gaussian sharp peak, it's skewed to the left, um, to the low temperature side. Okay, so this is, um, <laughs> this is the sock slip. So I mentioned, again, not having any real world experience. Um, growing up, I knew a person with this last name, Cajun guy, and his name was Soleil. And so I'm talking about the Soleil process and some petroleum engineer says, you mean sock slip. So mm -hmm. yeah, <laughs> can imagine my embarrassment. Um, Okay, so you, you basically, you take your sample, you dissolve it in a, in a solvent, something like N-heptane or something like that. You put it in the bottom of this flask and you heat it. Uh, so two things are gonna happen. One, the um, lower uh, carbon, the smaller carbon molecules are gonna basically come out of solution, um, rise up in the vapor form, hit the condenser where they drip back down. The solvent's gonna keep going, but it's gonna preferentially deposit the, um, the uh, solvents, I'm sorry, the, the solutes. Uh, you collect that in a thimble, you measure that, you weigh it, and that tells you um, all of the small carbons under 15. And then all the carbons that are, have uh, hydrocarbons that have over 15 carbons in it, they're gonna be left at the bottom of this as a residue. And so you just weigh that, and that gives you your total volume. Um, old technique, but it works. So you take the liquid that you got from the thimble, and you do a liquid chromatography. Um, I don't know if you did this in high school. You probably did in high school chemistry, but um, 
it's always fun. You basically take a strip of a medium, usually some kind of a paper, um, and then you dip it into the liquid. And based on its own vapor pressure, uh, it will rise through the column. And again, each chemical has its own uh, signature distance that it can move. It's been exhaustively studied. Um, but again, that's driven by vapor pressure. But we, for our, all of our purposes, we can really take it as a direct correlation with mass and class of the hydrocarbons. Um, and so the distance measured is, a direct, is an indirect uh, observation of the hydrocarbons themselves. Um, but we can use that proxy for real world applications. Um, the SARA method, uh, saturates, aromatics, resins, and asphaltines. Um, basically, we fractionate them. You, you, you use four different solvents. Uh, you start with the uh, larger ones, usually the asphaltines, and then work your way to the lighter ones. And so each time you put in the solvent, you dissolve as much as it's going to dissolve. You take that out and you do liquid chromatography. And you do it for all four of these. Um, and basically, it gives you a, a very strong characterization of your uh, of your source rocks. Um, so gas chromatography, uh, you, you have a little port. The one I've, uh, when I did it, you, you're taking um, syringes and putting it into a, someone would <laughs> literally take a pipe, bang it into the ground, pull it out with a you know, caked mud inside of it, cap both ends with wax, and then we would stick the syringe in, pull out some of the air, and then put it into the gas chromatograph. Um, so the basically, again, separates it by vapor pressure um, and it's detected by residence, residence time. So how long it actually stays in this coil. Um, headspace analysis, I kind of just mentioned it, but uh, usually with oil and gas, you're going to, they'll take out some cuttings, they'll wash them, they'll throw them in a steel bucket. Um, used to be paint buckets, but now they have, you know, proprietary ones. Um, but as long as it's airtight, that's the important part. So you then sample it, you put a plug on the top, uh, make sure you don't you know, allow for any contamination or anything like that. And then you sample the air that essentially the rock would have degassed into. So if you have um, concentrations of 10 to 100,000 uh, parts per million of hydrocarbons, then you know it's a very rich source. And if it's under that, uh, I'm sorry, if it's over that, then you know it's, it's very, very rich. So um, now this only gives you results for, uh, methane through, what is it, pentane? No, butane. So you're only looking at basically carbons, you know, one, two, three, and four, uh, very light stuff. Um, two and two through four can tell you if it's a wet gas or not. And then, um, you can actually do some other things. You can plot, um, the iso, uh, ISO configuration to normal configurations, and that can actually tell you, essentially, uh, give you a clue about the depth of the, of the maturation. Um, and then if you wanted to, you can actually do stable isotopes. Um, I'm a little weak on my petroleum or stable isotope ratios, but you could do carbon 13 and carbon 12. Um, you could technically do oxygen, but I don't know what data that would give you. Um, if you're interested, talk to Bob Gregory at SMU. He's our, he's our guy. So these are some chromatogra uh, chromatograms. Um, and the big important part of this is just to show you that for the large carbons uh, with over 30, notice the geometry here, very much skews to the left side um, as where it kind of goes, skews more and more as you get more and more mature uh, hydrocarbons. So these are signatures for the, oh, uh, yeah, so these are signatures for the different perigen types. So you can actually take your chromatogram, line it up with other reference uh, chromatograms and see, okay, this looks like a type one, type two. Maybe it looks like a mix of the two. Um, carbon preference index. Uh, so basically these are the peak heights, which are abundances uh, versus the carbon number. And they use an odd population from uh, C25 to C33 to basically get an overall view of the of source rock. Um, if the ratios are basically over uh, greater than one, then you know it's an immature rock. And if it's around one, then you know it's mature. And then the deeper you go, um, the more skewed it's gonna be, you know, until you hit the oil window and then it's zero. 
Um, so the, uh, I mentioned that you can resolve the keratin types. So you can tell what kind of um, source material you are maturing. Uh, you can also, there's the, the convergence of thermal maturi maturity here. Um, essentially experimental models that I mentioned, all the reference material, you can overlay chromatograms and, and, and see what lines up with what. Um, of course, now I'm sure there are data scientists that are doing it all on a magic computer, but. Um, and then again, you can see the contamination. I mentioned the S2 peak, uh, the low temperature side, um, that'll jump out on these as well. Uh, you see a, a sharp skewing. Um, so these are some common types. Uh, you can see different mixture ratios, 25% uh, type two and 75% type one for the second one, for instance. Um, again, all of these are very well documented. You can really compare what, you're, what you have to other reference materials um, and really get a good idea of what, uh, what kind of hydrocarbons you're looking at. So vitronite reflectance um, is still something of the gold standard now. Uh, basically, there is um, something called lignin, which will break down into what we call vitronite. And then you use reflecting light um, to, you can characterize the, the carriage in that way. Um, there are a few different ways to do it, but uh, essentially it's like what we do in petrology, a modal diagram. So you count the, what population is reflecting and also um, the, the reflectance value, how much, how bright it is. So, um, and we call that a percent rope. Uh, basically it's the, you do an oil immersion and you see the contrast of the light passing through that. So you do do 20 to 30 recordings uh, with standard deviation to get your error bars. Uh, and then you plot all of that versus depth. So basically as you're drilling, you do, you're taking your samples, you're doing all of these and you're plotting them. And uh, it's immediately gonna show you if there's interference from hydro, uh, migrating hydrocarbons or unconformities, which I'll explain in just a second. Um, so the lignin I mentioned, it's a primary component in um, cell walls uh, and for vascular plants. And it's actually, a, effectively the thing that allows for large trees to grow. And um, so you've heard of the Carboniferous period and that's characterized by these giant coal seams, giant coal beds where uh, lots of swamps, lots of plant matter that falls and decays, but it, the lignin can't break down. There's nothing in biology at the time that had evolved to be able to digest it. So it just sits there and made Pennsylvania rich. So, um, and then after, uh, I can't remember if chicken and egg, if it was a termite or bacteria, but um, something evolved to be able to digest it. And now we have the world we see today. Um, so this trend tool I mentioned, uh, the 10 to 10, 10 to 20 samples over four or 5,000 feet. Um, basically you can use these reflective values to uh, characterize everything you're seeing, but this is just, I know it's terrible to just read off of a slide, but this is a very succinct way of describing it. So um, it is an indicator of a sediment's thermal maturity, which is the product of the cumulate time temperature history. It can indicate if generation could have taken place uh, and suggest the types of hydrocarbons that may have been formed, thereby identifying which source rocks are potential contributors to a petroleum system. Uh, oh, and uh, vitronite reflectance data can be used to help constrain and validate basin models. So it is very important in the large uh, picture and can be um, just invaluable data. So uh, a couple of figures here, just to give you an idea. These are classic um, numbers that describe uh, reflectance values that reflect the different carogens. And then over here kind of shows you uh, a visual graphic of this. It doesn't really mean much unless you've actually seen it through a microscope, but um, that is a whole other class in and of itself, if not a uh, master's thesis. But, um, but essentially, these are what these reflected um, fields, of, fields of view look like. Um, so the row anomalies I mentioned earlier. So if you have a surface unconformity, say there was a million year period where you had um, maybe a reactivated fault or something like that, 
And basically you have sediment uh, piracy is, is something basically is being stripped off the top. Um, that's actually gonna be reflected in your row values. You can actually see a skew. If you look on the um, left side here, this is for essentially a continuous sedimentation. Um, and so just a, um, a basically equal subsidence or, or more or less constant subsidence. And then on the right side, it shows what would happen if you uh, uplifted it and had a, uh, an unconformity of some sort. So it does absolutely skew. Um, yeah. Okay, and that's all I have. Um, so real quick, this is a picture of the Permian Basin. This is the Midland Basin. You can see the utter beauty of industry. And then that's a picture uh, taken by a guy I went to high school with who's currently in the uh, on the North Slope in Alaska, being an old man. Mm. So, all right, any questions? Yeah. Um, so the total organic carbon relates to the richness. Why do you want a richer oil? Does that have more like energy to use or what's the... Yeah, so ideally you want an oil that has... Um, a degree of asphaltines, you want some heavy stuff and you want some light stuff. You don't want all gas um, because then you're just gas and you can't make diesel and gasoline and plastics and things like that. Um, and But you don't want it to be too immature because then your, your pay dirt stuff that's coming up out of the ground is effectively like a low grade ore. You know? So it's it have to do more processing to pull out the valuable components and things like that. Wash it. With what? Yeah, so so generally you would just, <laughs> I mean, some people just literally will scrub it in a detergent. But um, you, so when you're you're pumping the mud down there and it's pulling up all the little cuttings, and so you, you take those, um, literally just give them a bath and put them in an airtight container. Um, if you see it in your geochemistry, sometimes you can correct for it, and a good geochemist will be able to see that signature. Okay. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. Uh, well, I guess um, my question is about well, more about kind of like the future of the oil industry and stuff like that. Like, um, <laughs> like I know that a lot of things are changing. Uh, where do you think? Um, I don't know. Um, geologists having uh, studying oil. Um, what aspects of that, like, uh, I know that they're drifting away from using oil as a fuel source. Um, what other good applicable uh, things would they do with oil, um, I guess, in the future, continue doing with oil? We're, we're always going to need petroleum for reasons. Yeah. Um, you know, at least for the next hundred years. Uh, lubricants, plastics, um, fertilizers. Um, Things like that. Uh, I mean, hopefully, the demand for oil as a fuel will decrease with you know renewables and other sources. Um, hopefully, bigger takes a bigger chunk of the energy market. Things like that. Um, so e exploration is definitely going more to the geophysicist side, mm -hmm. and even some of the geophysicists are being booted out by the data scientists, the so crunchers that can come up with an algorithm that can replace a team of you know, five old guys with slide rulers. Um, but ultimately, you know, so they, they find, they do their magic geophysics stuff and say, there's oil here. So someone's still gonna drill it. And someone's still gonna characterize it. So you're always gonna have a need for a geochemist. Um, you're always gonna have a need for a geologist because, um, you know, uh, seismic lines are great. But um, at the end of the day, not all rocks are the same. Just because something has the same, you know, seismic velocity or something like that doesn't mean that it's to it be a moral. It could be, you know, this, that, or the other. And the geophysicists don't don't even know the word porosity. All right, I like those <laughs> geophysicists. <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> it makes me feel secure. <laughs> 
Did that answer your question, Bill? Yeah, yeah. I guess I was just kind of get that, trying to get a feel for it. If uh, if a student were to go into studying oil, um, would they want also like a backup plan? Yeah, by no choice. By no choice. Learn to code. Learn to code. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a part of Yeah. I mean, so the more you know, the better you are. The best geologists are the ones that see the most rocks. Um, any anything you can put in your little toolbox, you know, that, that can help you do it, you know, and and then just puff it up on your resume. Yeah. Uh, I'm gonna call myself a geochemist. Geochemist. <laughs> But <laughs> yeah. you said you like taught yourself all this stuff about petroleum. Yeah. Like the well, okay. So um, I, I will say that uh, we in the Permian Basin class, Lowell had someone from Pioneer, um, uh, a geochemist, come and do a talk, and that kind of started me down this road. Where I got pretty interested in the petroleum plugins from there. Okay, because I was going to ask you what got you interested specifically in learning about. Um, okay, so so for the IBA, um, and uh, oh, I think. Solo wasn't here when I when I bragged. <laughs> so um, when we did IBA, going into it, uh, I knew I was going to do it. I knew it was going to start um, a couple weeks into the semester, and so I wanted to be the geochemist for it because we had uh, we had two geophysicists, Polly and uh, Yassine. Um, and then we had our petrophysicist, Catherine, and then Saloa was going to be doing like kind of a lot of the other, what were your geologists? Geologists, yeah. So kind of, uh, and so I was going to be the geochemist, right? And I bought the book and read through it and did all the things. And um, then we got our data packet and there was absolutely zero geochemistry. To do. And I mean, zero geochemistry. So there was some petrophysics and I tried to help out on that, but I ended up basically taking the risk management stuff and felt like a used car salesman because I <laughs> calculate a number and then I'd bring it to the people and they're like, oh, that's too low. And I'd do it again and that's too high. And so finally I just found the sweet spot where people stopped, you know, gasping or grunting and realized how arbitrary it is. So that, that was my impetus to, to, to read that. You can also check the chat to see if anyone else has questions there for our people online. Oh, you want to go up to the very right top and click the chat button. I don't think we have any. No. Nope. So, unless anyone wants to chime in online about any questions. All right. All right. All right. So thank you, Jordan, so much. Uh, we are going to still hammer into y'all to register for Geo Club on the presence. I think most of y'all at this point already have. It's field trip stuff. We're not going to dig too into it because, you know, we've got 45 members now, which is basically pretty much everyone in the club, if not everyone. Wait, Katie, we have a question. Okay. In the chat. I've said from the beginning, and I'll continue to say, this club is for all of you. It's not for us. It's for you guys. And things that we do want you guys to have, scholarship, because who doesn't love free money, and internships. So this is the first scholarship we have available. Which is the Max Boring Scholarship? You get a thousand dollars. Deadline is June 30th, 2022. So you're going to see this till June 30th, 2022. So if you are interested, this is the website. We will send the link in the group me. So yeah, apply, free money. And then the second one, if you check your emails, you should already have seen this. Notes, check your emails. Anyways, this is the East Texas Communities Foundation. They have tons of scholarships that are available to you. These are two that are already applicable. The East Texas Geological Society Scholarship. Here are all the requirements, GPA. You may have to write an essay, fill in some documents. And then the Natural Gas Society of East Texas Scholarship. These are two that are available. The first one is renewable for two years. Check it out. And then 
They have also made available that you can use their matching tool. As long as you fill in your details, there are tons of other scholarships apart from these two. Apply, please, it's free money. And application starts from December 1st. So start gathering your papers. If you need letters or recommendations, start gathering them right now. So yeah, good luck. And then we also have this internship from the re-engineering group. They are looking for geology students who can work in their lab. So if you are interested and you want, or you want to find out more information, their information is displayed right here. You can contact them, or if you know somebody else that would be applicable for this role, please share. You never know who may need this. Yeah. Sure. Uh, so UTD was unable to secure a booth for the Dallas Gem and Mural Society show in the skeet. But I know a lot of us will still be attending. So it is, you know, most of us, I think, would be considered adults in this situation. So it'd be $8 to get in. I would hope everyone's considered adults and not children under 12. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's going to be out of the skeet. I know it doesn't say the uh, address on here, but um, it's very easy to Google and we can always send that information out in the chat. They just did not have a very good flyer set up for this. Okay, so speaking of tricks, we're finally at a point where we can start splitting the tricks for the group. And uh, we have been working to organize one for the end of this, um, this month. So it's gonna be at the Ron Coleman mine in uh, Jesseville, Arkansas. There's two other mines around the area that we can also dig at. Um, we're planning for it to be like a two night, three day trip at a campsite that will have running water and electricity. Um, and we're just trying to see how interested y'all are in this, you know? Uh, so I guess by raising hands, if y'all are interested in something like this. When is this going to be? Uh, the end of this month. So it should be the 26th, I'm sorry, the 27th through the 29th. So Friday, Friday through Sunday, whichever day is the day after Thanksgiving. The day after Thanksgiving, is yeah. it? Okay. What what days work for y'all? Because we were trying to consider um, finals coming up in December and all the other, you know, the Thanksgiving break. That's the day that we felt would be best for everybody. That doesn't work. It's it's moving. So. You can do it early next semester, maybe? Early next semester. Yeah, we can do it next semester, too. Yeah. Our hope is to at least get one trip in this semester. So, um, and it might end up falling on December break, or Christmas break, too, as well. So I mean, we need at least eight to ten people to do this to facilitate it. Um, and we have other trips coming up. So if y'all are interested, then we can definitely organize this and put it together this semester, whatever time that's best for y'all. The SOC has not been very kind to us about field trips, unfortunately, since COVID. So it's been quite difficult. We've thrown out a couple different ideas that were pretty much shot down. So it's not like we are not trying. We are actually doing stuff for yeah, this. So it's a long food a day. Everything's going to be paid for as far as the event and trip um, and transportation. Uh, so we have three mines that we can dig from. They're all in the same area. There's a mine tour at this one specifically. Um, and it'll be fun. We'll just be able to get together. John, would you guys like go? Because I know Hot Springs is like really right there. Yeah, yeah. Would you yeah. guys like go into the downtown and like have a night where you're just like on the strip? Definitely. Yeah. Don't yeah. Know, that's yeah. definitely worth it. We're it's leaving like, it kind of open to like, like what everyone like, wants to do. Like like Hot Springs, so yeah, I love it. Yeah, it is. You guys are in that uh, part of the world. Um, I think like maybe 10 miles outside of Hot Springs, something like that. There's this place called Magna Cove. Um, it's an amazing uh, like Lanphier, like um, weird chemistry, uh, make big rocks and stuff like that. Um, it's definitely worth it. And I got, I have some uh, field trip information from uh, Magna Cove. Yeah, pretty amazing place. Did you send that to? I will, yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah, because we're, again, we're leaving it pretty open to what everyone wants to do, because we're not going to be super strict of like field camp, yeah, we're doing this today, sort of thing of like, it's, you know, we want to do cool geology stuff, but also no one wants to get run into the ground on this trip of like assignments, so we're not doing that. We'll set out a poll on Ruby, um, just see if you're interested or not, and I'll like, feel free to put some suggestions on what days y'all think would be best for y'all, so we can keep working on it. Yeah, I think we do have a suggestion box around here. I think it's that right there with all the squiggles. Um, 
I believe that Sarbox, uh, if y'all have like suggested field trips that you want to go do, we're always down for suggestions or like speakers or anything like that. I think that's important to note. All right, so. So yeah, the mineral sales are back on actually today. I have a special on selenite and roses over here. And of course the standard stuff. So if you guys are interested, let me know. Also, I'll be down at the lab from one to three today. If any of you are interested in seeing some of the minerals. Yeah, some some, yeah Kidwell Collection, thank you. Thank you, Rob Lubinsky of the Arkenstone. All right, and last but not least, I think everyone here has pretty much signed up for all of our socials. But again, this is like our best way of staying in the loop and all that sort of stuff. So we post, you know, generally we post just like flyers and that sort of information on our Instagram and the group meetings really where if you want to be of like, you know, you can ask a silly question of like, hey, does anyone have any tent poles? I don't know where mine are sort of thing. Um, and then the Facebook, which is a really good connection for alumni, as a lot of you probably know, even though that's like, you know, a little bit more old people central. So, <laughs> all right. And now I guess we could do the mineral draw. If everyone wants to make sure y'all are signed in. Okay. Okay, that's easy. Yeah. All right, sorry, life is easier. Thank you all for signing in. Katie, can you hear me? Oh my God. What is the final number? Okay, uh, 19. 19. Two. Two. That's one of the officers. Oh. Two. We're usually sending after, anyways. Two, six. One. <laughs> one. <laughs> six through 19. Gotta tell me these things. I'm sorry. No so nine. Okay, Lewis. Lewis. Hey. Awesome. Thank yeah, you all so much. Pizza? Yes. It's over there on the other side. Same side. Grab and go again so the SOC doesn't get mad. Thank you all for attending. We really appreciate it. Thank you for Jordan for presenting for us today.